afternoon for this special introduction. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, a few things. They are all uh, connected with the spin transport and production of spin current, detection of spin currents. This is the outli outline of the talk. The first part actually takes uh, one, ha one third of the talk, and it's mostly, well, mostly prepared for students. There are not many here, but there are a few. And then I'll mention about uh, some recent developments, uh, theoretical and also experimental. So a very simple, a very simple view, neglected scattering. This is a charged current in a, in a metal. Spins with opposite, uh, electrons with opposite spins, they're moving freely. Of course, as I said, a simple view. And here we have charge flux without the spin flux because the spins have opposite direction and, they and their transport is canceled. The next one, we show electrons with opposite spins moving in opposite directions. In this case, we have no charge flux through this cross section, but we have sp spin uh, flux. We can say that either we have a spin current with a spin up in this direction or a spin current in this direction, they, they both add. And uh, as, as you know, uh, an effect was proposed uh, 40 years ago by Diakon of Imperial and it was rediscovered by Hirsch in 1999 that allows one to convert a spin current into a charge current to a spin current. And this is called the spin hole effect. Uh, it, it happens, it occurs in materials that have a large spin opt coupling. And we can also see this in this animation. If we have a charge current and we have uh, scattering uh, that is sensitive to this spin orbit coupling, then electrons will spin up will be deflected uh, upwards and electrons spin down, deflected downwards, so that LS is has the same sign. And uh, uh, this effect allows one to convert a charge current to a spin current, and uh, one can express this by this expression here, JS, is proportional to the charge current. And this is uh, a, a coefficient which is called the spin hole angle. And this spin hole angle uh, best uh, around varies between 10 to 20 percent. 20 percent in some very special cases. But this is very large. So 10 to 20 percent of the electrons are actually deflected in this way. Well, sigma is the spin polarization. And in platinum, the number varies from 5% to 10%. And uh, th that's a very efficient uh, material to convert uh, charge current to spin current, or vice versa. Well, in 2002, these gentlemen, and two of them are, are here. I'm very privileged to talk to both of them at the same time. Uh, Bratas, Yarot. Yaroslav Cerkovinak and Gerrit Bauer, the Halpring, predicted theoretically uh, a very, uh, very important and very stimulating effect, which is this, the spin pumping effect. They predicted that if we have a, the magnetization processing like in a ferromagnetic resonance experiment, uh, there is a flow of angular momentum across the interface of the ferromagnetic metal and a normal metal. The no normal metal means non-magnetic metal, but now we know that the, ma the metal can also be magnetic. And the spin current will actually die out because it, it produces diffusion and it decays away. Uh, so the spin current, the spin perception produces a spin current, and as Garrett showed the uh, yesterday, uh, this effect is the inverse of the spin torque effect. And they came up with, with an expression for this. 
the magnetization precession will produce an effect here. They introduce this quantity, the spin mixing conductance, which is uh, uh, which measures the efficiency by which the spin current uh, uh, flows from one to the other. And as I said, this is the inverse of the spin transfer torque excitation by a spin current. Uh, and there, there were several papers in the same year, but uh, what they proposed, or I'll show uh, a little later, uh, was analyzed uh, using uh, the so-called spin accumulation, which is an imbalance uh, bit of the chemical potential for electrons to spin up and we spin down. We, uh, the difference between the two chemical potential gives what is called spin accumulation. By conservation of angular momentum, they obtain a diffusion equation for this spin accumulation with a characteristic spin diffusion length that involves this the diffusion constant and the spin flip scattering. And for platinum, this is 5 nanometer. For copper, it's 200 nanometer, as showed uh, earlier today. And the spin current is simply the gradient of the spin accumulation. So uh, this is a standard way to study spin transport and spin flux in metals. And this gives the diffusion that I mentioned before. Now, how one does, uh, does the, the experiment for exciting uh, the spin current? We, ha we have a microwave generator that uh, sends the radiation to a sample that can be in a cavity or it can be in a waveguide or a strip line, and one, use one, uh, one observes either the reflection or the transmission different ways. And very often, one modulates the applied magnetic field so that using a lock-in detection, lock-in amplifier detection, one measures the derivative of the absorption curve. And the absorption curve is, is approximate a Lorentzian. So this is the Lorentzian derivative of a permalloy film. Uh, if it's a film, the frequency is given by this expression here uh, that gives the square root uh, very often uh, used to show that one is actually involved in a ferromagnetic resonance experiment. What they actually proposed, uh, besides proposing the spin current, they proposed that this would uh, produce an increase in the damping of the magnetic system because there is a flow out of angular momentum out of the ferromagnetic material. And this actually comes from this expression. This is the landau lipschitz gilbert equation. And this uh, spin current, which is a torque, it, uh, it actually is has the, the, the same shape as the Gilbert damping expression. So this change in the damping, uh, 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 as I said, by the flow of angular momentum out. This was, had been observed or was observed about the same time by Mizukami and Ando in 2002. This is not that picture. This, this is uh, made in our lab. This is a simple film of permaloy. Even a simple film of permaloy has a damping, this is the line width, a damping that increases with decreasing thickness. And this goes with 1 over t square, 1 over thickness square, uh, which is due to the 2 magnum scattering process that was proposed a few years earlier. But then if you put platinum, the damping increases. And this difference here is goes with the 1 over t fm, one of the, the inverse of the, of the thickness, which, was, uh, which is the expression proposed in, in that paper. It goes uh, up with frequency and inversely with the, with, the, uh, with the thickness. So it becomes important in thin films. A oh, uh, couple of years later, uh, my colleague Antonio Azevedo 
had the idea of taking a ferromagnetic material. Actually, he had a tri-layer because he was looking for something else. But the fact is that it's a ferromagnetic uh, material with a non-magnetic material and put uh, contacts here to measure the voltage. This is the fMR signal, the Lorenzo derivative. And at the same field, they observed this uh, voltage. The voltage increases with the microwave power. Uh, they made the experiments with the uh, different materials. And uh, see the, the title. We were not sure uh, how the spin current was being converted into charge current. So there was a question mark here. And this was presented in a conference uh, as, a, as a poster, actually. And some people that saw the poster, oh, this is garbage. <laughs> Doesn't, this is a classical effect. Effect has no, no sense. But at that point, uh, we mentioned that this uh, we have an evidence that we have a pure spin current, which is pumped into the normal metal via the modulation of the interface scattering matrix. So we are convinced that this uh, this was spin pumping, but we could not uh, explain how the the, the 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 charge current was was created. One year later. Uh, A.G. Saitor and uh, his colleagues, and they had a, a, a very good uh, theoretical uh, physicist in the group. They did a very similar experiments, but they explained in terms of the inverse spin hole effect. And the inverse spin hole effect is just the Onzaga reciprocal of the, of the spin hole effect. Uh, now if we have electrons with opposite spins moving in opposite directions, and now they are deflected in the same direction, so one has a build-up of charge and, and a voltage. And so spin current is converted into charge current, and the expression is the same, except that the vector product changes the, the sign, uh, because we are using the same dimensions to represent charge current and spin current. Well, uh, A.G. Saito, uh, a few years later, two years later, he did a different experiment. He took a film of permaloy and applied a temperature difference along the film and put platinum strips here, and they measured the voltage. The voltage is uh, the result of the fact that uh, a spin current is produced by the temperature gradient. The spin current builds up spin accumulation here. So there is a spin current going up uh, here and coming down here. And uh, the platinum strips convert them into charge current. So they measure negative voltage here in one, one end and positive voltage in the other end. And they named this the spin Sibic effect. Uh, and they said that at the end of the paper, we anticipate that the spin Sibic effect will transform basic research on spin currents and lead to dramatic advances in the spintronic devices. Uh, everybody would like to write something at the end of this paper, but, it, but they were right. <laughs> they were right. Uh, the, uh, there was a lot of work in the spin Sibic effect. Uh, this morning, Axel spoke about the spin Sibic effect, the anti-ferromagnet, and so on. Uh, the, the theoretical explana explanation of, uh, of the experiments came out in this paper by uh, Hatami and, and Gerrit Bauer in a special number of the solid-state communication on spintronics. There were many important papers in the same issue. What they do is that they treat the the uh, electron distribution function uh, with the spin up or down. Uh, the, the temperature gradient uh, can be uh, the effect of the temperature gradient on, on the chemical potential uh, can be uh, obtained by Boltzmann equation. They also show that the, uh, the, uh, the, the spin accumulation will uh, satisfy the diffusion equation and they obtain uh, the spin accumulation here or here and the spin current here 
And this depends on the length scale of the sample and the and this, uh, this spin flip uh, diffusion length. Actually, I understand that there is a, a big mismatch between the calculated and the experiment. The fact that uh, the basic explanation is here. Well, this is the, the review. It took about a third of the talk, a little bit more. So I'm going to talk about some more recent developments. Uh, again, Asia Saitov, two years later, 2000, they did a spin pumping experiment using YIG. Is now nobody is afraid of YIG in this <laughs> audience, right? <laughs> after, after Garrett's talk. So YIG, very complicated structure, but very <laughs> simple properties, very important material. Uh, they put a platinum layer, deposit a platinum layer on a YIG uh, film. I don't, I don't remember if it was a film or a, or a, or a, 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 a film, not a bulb. And they measure the voltage by varying the magnetic field. Actually, this is an ugly signal. It's difficult to reproduce such a, an ugly signal. We see that this is very broad, 200 distance here. Uh, nowadays, as I said, for reasons that we don't understand, we do experiments with egg platinum, and we obtain very thin uh, uh, voltage lines, spin pumping lines. It's positive with one direction of the field. It is zero at 90 degrees and inverts if we invert the field. Uh, we see here two little, or a few little uh, peaks corresponding to standing spin waves. Since the line with the small, the standing spin waves are there. If we use, instead of platinum, we use iridium manganese and this morning, Axel mentioned about the spin hole effect in the mechanism. We actually see more pronounced uh, spin wave uh, peaks. Uh, and so, uh, uh, this is a very si efficient system. YEG and other metallic materials, they uh, see that we are producing here voltages which are larger. Not because the spin ho hole angle in iridium manganese is large, but because the resistance, the resistivity of iridium manganese is larger than platinum. Oh, the same group, in the same year, Asia, Saitor, and company, uh, they did the spin Seebeck effect with yttrium iron garnet. First, they used the conventional setup, conventional as they call, is the the temperature gradient applied along the film with two little platinum strips to convert spin current into charge current. But then they put, they, 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 they place, they, they, they place the temperature gradient not along but across the thickness of the egg film. They did experiment with egg, with bulk egg but also with film. Uh, and uh, um, so this, again, there was a lot of excitation about this. And the, in the following year, there was a special number on, on uh, nature materials. And uh, Garrett, uh, Saito, and Liz wrote a nice paper on spin color electronics. And uh, this configuration is called longitudinal because the spin current is along with the temperature gradient. And this one is called Transverse because the spin current is transverse to the temperature gradient. Not the most fortunate names, but, but now that's the way people call. Uh, but it turns out that this configuration is much more uh, st studied, much more detailed, and it's much more efficient. So gradually the longitudinal is, is, is being forgotten, and we call just the spin Seebeck effect. Now, how come we have uh, spin current in egg? And uh, as actually was shown the yesterday, uh, the spin waves by, by Garrett and I forgot who was the other one. Uh, uh, spin waves carry angular momentum. So they carry spin current. Uh, 
the spin current is formally given by the, the number of magnons uh, times the summation of the Brillouin zone, number of magnons times the group velocity. And uh, in intermodal granite, I'm showing only the acoustic mode. We, we, not, we know that the optical modes are very complicated and, and um, much more difficult to introduce in some calculation. e 2 garnet has this uh, dispersion relation, uh, really parabolic, and uh, the frequency ranging up to uh, several few terahertz. Well, uh, let's talk now about uh, spin transport in ferromagnetic insulators. In 2012, uh, Shufen Zeng and his student uh, proposed uh, the following experiment, and, and they did calculation. Uh, this is, a, it, let's say, an intermodal garnet, uh, any ins ferromagnetic insulator, and, and there are two uh, metallic films at the opposite sides. So if there is a current a charge current in the in the metal here. By the spin hole effect, uh, a, a spin current will be produced, and then it will flow across the ferromagnetic layer, and and reach the non-magnetic layer. Here, here it will be converted into a charge current. And this is actually a way to do the so-called non-local measure. This non-local resistance. You pass a current here and you measure a voltage somewhere else. Well, they, they analyzed this in the following way. They introduced a quantity which is called the magnum accumulation. It has some parallel to the, to the spin accumulation for metals. Uh, the magnum accumulation is the number of magnums, uh, uh, total number of magnums, in excess of equilibrium. The magnus in equilibrium are here at the Bose Einstein distribution function, and this is the number of magnus out of equilibrium for some reason. This difference integrated gives um, um, something which is not a function of K, but just a function of space or temperature, which, which they call magnus accumulation. And they show that the magnus accumulation obeys a diffusion equation uh, just like the magnum, just like the spin accumulation. Well, this experiment was shown uh, yesterday by, by Garrett, uh, 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 a measurement of the non-local resistance. It, it's a different geometry, but the idea is that the physical phenomena involved is the same. It has a current here. The charge current creates a spin current that is transported through the egg and detected uh, as a charge current in the other, uh, in the other strip. And they measured the, this resistance, voltage here divided by current here, and they see that it decays sort of exponentially with the distance. Well, uh, if one uses the diffusion equation that I just showed, one obtains uh, the ex exponential decay and the fit uh, to the to the data uh, gives uh, a magnum uh, diffusion length or whatever he called a different thing of 9.4 micrometers, v very large one. Well, the Schufenzeng, who is a theoretician, also got involved with several Chinese. The Chinese are very active. <laughs> in all areas, including spintronics. <laughs> and they, they actually did the, 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 the experiment with, with this, uh, reproducing what they had thought theoretically. Uh, it's, it's a film of the egg produced by sputtering and two uh, platinum strips on the two sides. Uh, and they, they measured the voltage as a function of distance, of thickness, fit with an exponential uh, function, and they obtain uh, 
diffusion lengths of only 38 nanometers. Uh, the interpretation is that when they, when they grow YIG with very small thickness uh, on platinum, they don't really get a good crystal, a good YIG crystal. While in the experiment of Cornelissing that I showed before, they have a good crystalline YIG, and perhaps that's the reason why the diffusion lens is so much small. But what I want to, to show here is that the diffusion uh, of marginal accumulation explains uh, this experiment. Now I'm going to show a similar thing. Uh, 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 in that an experiment done with an antiferromagnet that was also mentioned here today. Uh, there were experiments done by different people. The first one by the French group. <coughs> this is a Yeg film, a nickel oxide layer, and a platinum layer. They do ferromagnetic resonance of Yeg, and this produces spin current that flows through the nickel oxide and goes to platinum. They show that if instead of having nickel oxide, you have magnesium oxide of any thickness, there is no voltage. Uh, because magnesium oxide is, is an insulator and it's not magnetic. Nickel oxide is an insulator, but it is, it is antiferromagnetic at room temperature. So this is the voltage measured as a functional magnetic field. Uh, negative uh, voltage and positive here because the field uh, reverses. This is YEG, and you see that the voltage is, uh, is about uh, 20 microvolts here. Then they put a nickel oxide layer and do the measurements again. They, they obtain similar signals, but now uh, 20 times smaller in, in amplitude. And they do this varying the thickness of the nickel oxide layer. And get these numbers here for, for different, uh, uh, they measure with, diff with different powers. But let's look at this one. Uh, what this shows is that as the nickel oxide thickness increases, initially there is an increase in the voltage, and then there is a decrease. Oh, uh, the same experiments were done by the, by the Sino-American group. Where is it? I, I forgot. I'm sorry. I, I missed the, I was uh, worried that I had too many slides and I, start, I, st I, I started cutting slides. I, 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 I cut the one that showed the paper of uh, Jan at uh, Ohio State University. Yen, Ohio State University. Uh, they do very similar experiments. In fact, I use the same drawing with the, of the other paper, but it's nice. And they measure the, the voltage. Me uh, they measure the voltage in the platinum layer. Here, with no nickel oxide, and then as you increase the nickel oxide, you see that increases here. One nanometer, it's larger. And then it eventually decreases. Uh, their plot, which was also showed uh, by Axel this morning, shows that uh, with different insulators, uh, the, the decay with thickness is very fast. But with nickel oxide, it initially increases and then eventually decreases exponentially. So they show that this could not be expressed by simple exponential. Uh, then I'm going to show the, the model that we produce uh, for this, which is based on the diffusion of the spin accumulation. If we take an antiferromagnet, uh, an insu antiferromagnet insulator, manganese fluoride, that was uh, uh, described in detail this morning by Axel, uh, because we have two different spins, we have two excitation modes. The mode with zero, zero wave vector are uniform modes in which in one of them, the spins process in the same uh, direction, but with different cone angles. 
Uh, the other mold has just the opposite. They process in the opposite direction and have a larger mold. The, the, the fact is this. Uh, this mold has a, a, a smaller spin deviation from the equilibrium direction than this one. This, uh, let me say the other, the other, the other way. The spin deviation corresponding to this mode is, is positive, while this one is negative, because they, they, are, they are opposite. So in the case of manganese fluoride, if we have no magnetic field applied, uh, what happens is that the spin current is the sum of the spin currents of magnums of uh, one mode and magnums of the other mode. And they have opposite signs because of the, of the sign of the, of the spin deviation that I just mentioned. In the case of, of manganese fluoride, both have the same uh, group velocity. So the group velocity is, is here. And if the magnetic field is zero, uh, the two, and we are talking about uh, uh, excitation by uh, thermal excitation, the two occupation numbers are the same, so the, mag the, the spin current is zero. I'm not going to show the spin symmetric effect because I knew you were showing the tape, but the fact that the spin symmetric effect in magnetic fluoride is zero with zero magnetic field is due to this fact. But then, if you apply a magnetic field, uh, the, the occupation numbers will be different. The group velocities are still the same because they are parallel, but then the spin current is different than zero. Now, the situation in nickel oxide is different. I forgot to write here nickel oxide. Uh, this is uh, uh, the crystal lattice, very similar to what I showed this also this morning. Nickel oxide is a hard accent of ferromagnet, which means that there is one axis which is uh, this, which is hard, so the spins lie in, the, in a one, one, one plane. And in this one, one, one plane, there is also a small anisotropy. So some people call nickel oxide a two axis antiferromagnet, not only one axis. And now the spin waves, if we look far uh, over the whole Brillouin zone, they are similar to what uh, I showed in manganese fluoride. But there is a difference here which is important. Near the zone center, even with no magnetic field, they are not degenerate because of the, f of the action of the two anisotropies. One has a higher frequency because of the anisotropy, of the hard anisotropy, and the one has a lower frequency. And so at the... Uh, uh, for magnet excited uh, thermally, uh, the occupation numbers will be different in these two cases. And notice, notice that the group velocities are also different. So uh, this is the magnum spin current that I showed before. That's the group velocity. So we introduce here the, so this is the, the spin current uh, in terms of the magnet accumulation for the two, and we we have here a factor that represents the ratio of the two group velocities. We can calculate the number of magnums in excess of equilibrium using Boltzmann equation, and we can put the diffusion equation. After we find the, the, the magnum accumulation, we calculate the magnum spin current. And uh, to solve uh, the solution of Boltzmann equation, we can solve uh, by linearization, and we we put the result in the in, in the spin current, and we obtain an expression that involves several integrals, but which are not difficult to to perform because they are only integrals uh, over the Brillouin zone. Uh, so the spin current produced by the gradient in magnet accumulation is given by this conservation of angular momentum. Uh, is here, so we, the magnums here also obey the diffusion equation. And, and then uh, uh, 
the solution of the diffusion equation will, will be a combination of exponentials or hyperbolic functions. And if we find the margin accumulation, we can find the spin current. So this is the problem that we have. Uh, magnetization processing here. By spin pumping, we have spin current in, in the antiferromagnetic insulator. Here we have diffusion. The solution is the one that I showed in the previous slide. And here we have the spin current flowing into the, uh, the uh, non-magnetic layer. Uh, all uh, integral can be calculated without much problem. And at the end, we obtain the following. This is the voltage corresponding to a nickel oxide layer of thickness D. And this is the voltage for no nickel oxide, D equals zero. The solution of the equation that I show gave this. Uh, and we add uh, an adjustable parameter here because there is an uncertainty about the, 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 the spin mixing conductance at the interface. This expression is very similar to the one that has in, in uh, Yarrow Lab and in, in Bauer reviews of modern physics for a tri-layer system in which the middle layer is a non-magnetic uh, material. Very similar. Uh, and notice that this parameter R here is the ratio of the spin mixing conductance in the first sur surface uh, interface to the, to the one in the second interface. Uh, and C is just the, the spin mix mixing conductance in the second interface. We fit the theory to that data with the enhancement here. And we obtain the parameters. With these parameters, this expression, uh, uh, C 0.1, R 4.2, delta, and so on, the, the marginal diffusion length is 7.4 nanometer. Of course, the question is, why there is this increase here? Our interpretation is this. The R is the ratio of the two spin mixing conductors. If we, if we d equals 0, in other words, with no nickel oxide, uh, this drops down is probably, uh, that's the conclusion of the model. If the model is correct, that's the, the conclusion of the model. The spin mixing conductors between uh, platinum and the egg is smaller than uh, in the egg nickel oxide, which is not unreasonable because the egg and nickel oxide are magnetic system, the exchange may be much larger between the egg. The interfacial exchange may be much larger in the egg in nickel oxide than in the egg in platinum. Uh, oh, that's what I say here. This was published last year. And soon after, uh, Xian and his group did similar experiments. But instead of producing the spin current, by spin pumping, they produce by spin Seebeck. They apply that temperature difference. The spin current is produced in the egg and flows uh, through the nickel oxide layer and is detected in the platinum. Again, they, they see this enhancement. And again, we put the theory. Now the enhancement is larger. Uh, this depends on the quality of the interfaces and so on. So uh, let me change now to the back to the spin Seebeck effect in insulators. And there is a controversial in terms of theories about this. I'm going to present uh, our, our model, which is very similar to the things that were done uh, for other systems. Let's say that we apply a temperature gradient between yttrium organite and platinum, say. Uh, the, the model assumes that the, the temperature gradient produces a flow of marginal accumulation, diffusion of uh, drift and diffusion. The marginal accumulation at the interface produces a spin current, which is detected by the inverse spin hole effect. 
So this is the expression for the magnum uh, accumulation here, the spin current. Uh, using Boltzmann equation, one finds that the spin current is a sum of two terms. One that is proportional to the gradient of the temperature, and the other that involves the diffusion of the, of the, of the, of the magnum accumulation. Here, uh, magnum is out of equilibrium, will produce a spin pumping, and that will produce a spin current in the other end. So this is the, again, the, the problem. We, we have to apply boundary conditions. The spin current is zero here because there is no, con uh, there is continuity of spin current everywhere. So since there is nothing here or there is a, a substrate, uh, spin current is here, 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 zero here. The spin current is continuous here, and here it's zero again. We solve them, and we find that the total spin current has a term that contains integrals over the below zone, and has a, 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 a factor uh, that, uh, that expresses the depend the variation with the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer. So uh, let me jump here. I, the important comparison here is uh, with the measurements of uh, Kelberg and, and several people. They they made the measurements of the of the spin Seebeck effect as a function of thickness of the egg layer. They produce several series of the egg by sputtering. Uh, this expression that comes out from our boundary condition fits very well their data here. And uh, notice, Axel, that this expression is very similar to what you showed this morning uh, uh, regarding the dependence of the uh, specific effect on the, on the thickness. Uh, I will also jump this, to show the last, last chapter. Uh, what happens if we have a, a, the, the permalloy layer that I mentioned was used to discover the spin effect? effect? Uh, I didn't mention about uh, the longitudinal spin effect effect in permalloy. And, and it said, uh, in review papers, very recently we hear that the spin effect effect cannot be measured in, in metallic ferromagnets because uh, the effect is contaminated by the classical nest effect. Which means this, if we apply a temperature gradient across, across the thickness of the permalloy, there is a classical effect called the, the nest effect by which electrons are, uh, uh, like the, the thermoelectric effect, electrons are driven by the temperature gradient, but then there is, a, in, a, in a metallic system, there is the anomalous Hall effect, and there will be a separation of charge. One can measure this uh, by uh, measuring the, the voltage at the ends uh, for different temperature differences varying the magnetic field. And what we measure is essentially the hysteresis cycle of permalloy because uh, the polarization changes in the magnetic field, and the voltage is proportional to the temperature gradient, so proportional to the temperature difference. And we see this is proportional here. We're showing here the, uh, uh, the plateau, see the, the anomalous hole, an anomalous nest uh, effect uh, voltage for field, for field in the in the z direction, it goes negative, and for field in the minus z direction, it goes in the other direction. So how can we measure the, the permalloy, uh, the spin Seebeck effect in permalloy? Well, what one can do is to put a nickel oxide layer between permalloy and platinum. The nickel oxide layer, as we know, conducts <coughs> the spin current, but blocks charge current. So with this scheme, one could act can actually measure the anomalous uh, nearest voltage 
on the permalloy layer in the spin Seebeck effect in something which is proportional to the spin Seebeck effect in the platinum layer because a spin current produced in the permalloy will flow through the nickel oxide and be converted into a charge current in platinum. So the measurement of this voltage here gives uh, very similar to the other. And you can see that this is the problem if we don't have the nickel oxide. We measure the two and we cannot separate. Uh, and then if we, if we measure uh, the same thing uh, with constant temperature but varying the angle, we see that uh, it's maximum for, for, for phi zero and goes to zero for 90 degrees. So this is actually depends on the, on this, on the direction of the magnetic field. And uh, for, uh, for fields in the z direction or in opposite direction, the, the voltage is proportional to the temperature difference. So uh, the spin current is, we are convinced that it's produced by uh, by the 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 spin by the spin Seebeck effect, longitudinal spin Seebeck effect in thermalite. So how can we interpret this? We go back to the Hatami and Bauer paper, but now we we have to solve with different boundary conditions as they did. But the, it's the same equation. Boltzmann equation, diffusion equation, and that's essentially what we did for the insulator. But in the insulator, we, deal, we dealt with the magnet accumulation, while in the metallic uh, ferromagnet, we deal with the spin accumulation. So this is the expression that they have in that paper for the charge current, the spin current, the heat current, uh, the linearized solution. Uh, for involving here the, the gradient of the charge accumulation, the spin ac chemical potential, spin accumulation, and gradient of the temperature. This gives a spin current that has two terms, very similar to the insulator. One proportional to the temperature gradient, the other proportional to the gradient of the spin accumulation. The boundary conditions are similar, zero here, continuous here, and zero here. And we obtain an expression which is similar, except that the form of, the, of this uh, parameter here is quite different. But we obtain the same, uh, the same thickness factor, precisely the same, because we have diffusion equation of, of similar quantities. So, Let's measure the, the thickness dependence of the two effects. Of the Anne, actually I'm showing here the current, the, the, the voltage that I showed before divided by the, by the resistance. In the case of the anomalous nest effect, as you see here, as the thickness increases from five to 100, the current increases and it's proportional, very proportional. Uh, on a current versus thickness. Now, with the, with the voltage measured in the platinum, we see that it quickly saturates, and that's the expression. That's the, the data and the fit of the data uh, to uh, the fit of the theory to of, of that e expression to the data. From here, we obtain uh, uh, a spin flip diffusion length of 6.7 uh, nanometers. So, uh, in summary, uh, experiments on spin transport and spin Seebeck effect provide strong evidences that both in ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic insulators, the mechanism of spin transport is diffusion of magnet accumulation. As I said, this is controversial because there are different proposals for, for, uh, for transport in antiferromagnetic. Benedetta is looking at me saying <laughs> yes, <laughs> because she, she has a paper that proposes a very different mechanism, right? Two fluids. And 
ferromagnetic insulator, normal metal, the bulk magnetic spin current model explains quantitatively the magnitude and the variation with temperature, with, the, with thickness and magnetic field of the voltage, and uh, the spin seback effect longitudinal configuration has been observed in permaloy, nickel oxide, normal metal, and can be explained by a model similar to the one for the insulator. Thank you very much. Oh yes, this is my collaborators, Antonio Azevedo here, Roberto who works in Chile, uh, and this is a beautiful picture of Recife. Thank you, Sergio. <laughs> yeah, but I said I would show if I had time. I, do I have time for one more slide?